And now our first conversation. The Federal Trade Commission has kicked off a series of hearings to consider how to better regulate the tech industry. For that, please welcome former FTC Commissioner Maureen Olshausen, Olshausen sorry, and current FTC Commissioner Rebecca Kelly Slaughter. Here to lead the conversation is the Atlantic's Washington editor at large and my colleague, Steve Clemens. Thank you all very much. Good morning. Welcome to the Atlantic Festival. Remember, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, uh, but we're going to sprint right now. Thank you so much for joining us. Ma Maureen, I know that you have been serving as acting commissioner. And a week ago, you, you retired. You stepped down after your terms um, ended. How, you're supposed to be in Florida. Uh, can you not give it up? No, it's, it's very hard. I've actually been in this space a very, a very long time. I was a commissioner right. for over six years and acting chairman for 15 months. Wow. And it, these are fascinating issues, ones I've worked on for uh, almost all of my legal career. So I uh, can't just unplug. <laughs> now, I know the FTC, um, but a lot of people don't know the FTC. They, they, you know, it's this sort of uh, you know, behind the scenes but powerful institution. And right now, you know, people have worries about deep partisanship, you have both Democratic, we have Becca here who's on, you know, Chuck Schumer's uh, agent. Uh, we have, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> but you have Democrats, you have Republicans that are appointed in part because, you know, they want to maintain, you know, some semblance of balance. You have five commissioners. Did you run it like a Republican shop? Well, when I was the um, acting chairman, I had uh, just one other colleague commissioner, Terrell McSweeney, and she was a Democrat. And so, you know, the, the narrative in Washington is that would be a recipe for gridlock and, you know, no, no progress. Uh, but instead, what I tried to do during my uh, time as acting chairman is drive to where there was really common ground. And there is a lot of common ground uh, in the things that the FTC does. We are primarily a law enforcement agency. Uh, we have a competition authority and consumer protection authority. So uh, that's what I focused on, and I was And happy. how many decisions did you get? We had more than 500 unanimous votes. We had a historic level of um, enforcement, uh, particularly in the uh, antitrust space. Uh, and I think that shows that having a clear idea of what the agency's mission is supposed to be and what its goals are and what we're trying to achieve in enforcement. There ought to be like a big banner, like 500 wins. Right, yes, exactly, the exactly. But, uh, and we did disagree occasionally, but right. when we did, we were transparent about it, and mm. then we moved on to, to, the next, to the next thing. Becca, maybe I can ask you for a moment. You're, you're a commissioner there now. Uh, I think Margaret Lowe set up very nicely some of the tensions that are coming, talking about technology, privacy, you know, the, the kind of, uh, uh, if you will, the consolidation, if you will, of some power. What are, the, what are the kinds of things that you as an agency right now are dealing with? Yeah, I think we're at a really exciting moment in economic history in America. I think it's a very exciting time to be at the FTC. Just right when she left. It's, yeah. We did overlap. <laughs> <laughs> we did. We got five months okay, together, good. which was very nice. <laughs> Um, it's a really exciting time to be here. You know, Chairman Simons has convened these hearings on competition and consumer protection in the 21st century. Uh, I think it's a really important time for us to be taking a close look at what we're doing both on our competition mission and our consumer protection mission. As Maureen talked about, what I'm very interested in is how those missions overlap, particularly because of the way technology is bringing difficult questions together. So you consider, for example, um, a merger between two companies that both control a substantial amount of consumer data. What are the privacy implications for that? How does that work on the consumer protection side? Um, or something that we usually think of as a consumer protection issue, data security and privacy. What happens when problems in that space arise in companies that have very large market share? How does that competition issue play in? So to my mind, it's a really important time to be thinking not only about how we can best achieve our missions in the two particular sides of the agency, but how we can use our expertise on both sides to uh, think about the questions holistically. So explain in kind of technical, well, maybe human terms, what do you do? Facebook was just apparently hacked this last week. You know, essentially people got in and were able to access data, which is, which is a remarkably scary thing uh, for some of us. And, and Equifax and others, that, you know, had, do, do you play a role after the fact when these giant data breaches occur? So I want to be very clear. Uh, the FTC has a policy of not confirming or denying investigations, so I don't want to talk about any specific company. We've had a couple of 
public confirmations, but I still wouldn't talk about those specific investigations. However, as a Guys, general... Guys, I tried, I tried. <laughs> almost got me there. Um, as a general matter, what we do is we use our authority to go back in, for example, the data security, data protection area, to go back and look at uh, what led to a breach, what caused it, and whether the company in any way uh, was unreasonable or unfair in mm. how it treated its data. And those are complicated legal questions. But listen, at the end of the day, uh, we can bring enforcement actions, and we do. And you know, under Maureen's tenure, they brought a number of important data security and privacy investigations. But it is a fact that these breaches keep happening. Uh, so I don't think anyone would say, and I'm certainly not going to sit here and say, that our ability to go back after the fact and investigate is an effective deterrent uh, to keeping, keeping data safe and mm -hmm. data secure. Uh, bipartisan commissioners for many years have talked about the need for more authority for the FTC to better prevent data breaches by giving us some rulemaking authority and giving us civil penalty authority. Most people don't appreciate or understand that unlike many other federal agencies, the FTC can't just issue new rules. We don't have that general rulemaking authority the way it is constituted for other agencies. We also don't have fining authority. We can't for the most part. With, with few exceptions. We can't just say, you did something wrong, we're going to penalize you with a big fine. We have to be able to tie any monetary remedy to mm. redress of specific harm. That is valuable and important in many cases, but also limits our ability to carry a very big stick and deter bad action. Maureen, do you agree that, that you would like to see the FTC get more rulemaking authority, more civil penalty authority? Uh, so I agree that I, I believe we need it in the area of data security and breach notification. Uh, there's a reason the FTC is designed to have this more limited authority. It's because we have a very broad statute. So unlike other agencies where Congress has made all the uh, you know, important uh, decisions and said, you know, we're going to ha you know, have this like, very detailed regulatory approach, and the agency has rules and then you know, the boundaries are clear and there's a fine and things like that. The FTC was created to be an agency with very broad general authority. So we have authority over unfair and deceptive acts or practices or unfair methods of competition. Mm -hmm. And so it made us very flexible and very responsive. Uh, but the, uh, the kind of counterweight to that is like a, a company may not know right off the bat what's going to be considered unfair, what's going to be considered a violation of the FTC Act. So Congress created us with this more general authority with a lot of flexibility, but the idea that we wouldn't uh, get um, like a, a, a fining authority until uh, it was a lot clearer where the boundaries are. So for example, in areas like the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, uh, COPPA, Congress laid out the, the parameters for the FTC, gave us streamlined rulemaking authority, and we can get fines. And I think that is an appropriate way to look at these things, where uh, the, the boundaries are clearer, the decisions have been made, what's a violation, and it's not a violation, and the FTC then operationalizes that, has a rule, brings an enforcement case. So I think mm -hmm. it makes sense for our general authority to be tied a lot more to the, to the redress, to the harm that the practice may have caused, right. and then where it's clearer to have more, like data so security, to have let's more Let's bounce penalty. this to the international stage, and, and I don't um, imply any criticism of the FTC in this, but I get the sense that Europe is more in the headlines in the regulatory front of America's tech industry than sometimes American institutions are. If you look at the GDPR or you look at the High Commissioner uh, uh, for Competition in Europe, um, uh, who gets enormous coverage in terms of what she's doing with Google or, or, or uh, uh, other penalties that have come out. And I'm just wondering if you think right now Europe is setting the standard for looking at these regulatory things and we're catching up, or is that a mistaken uh, impression? Look, I am not sure I would describe it as setting the standard. It is definitely true that they are operating differently than we are, and they have different laws that they are implementing. Mm -hmm. So their competition laws are not the same as ours. Their competition laws impose specific burdens on companies once they reach a certain market share. We don't have that under American law. Uh, GDPR, obviously, is not something that exists here, but right. 
you can see that, for example, California has looked at GDPR and said, wait, we, maybe we want something like that. So I think we have an opportunity right now. We can use this distinction to say, okay, here's what Europe is doing. What does that mean? How does that work in practice? We, there is a natural experiment going on that allows us to take a good hard look at what we have at the federal level and what we could or should be doing differently. That's one of the benefits, I think, of the hearings Chairman Simons has convened to ask some of those difficult questions. Um, it's also a catalyst, I think, for us to act at the federal level. I think the California law in particular has led to a lot of calls for federal legislations so that we don't have a patchwork of 50 different state laws. Those are understandable, those are understandable calls, but I think it's also important to recognize that uh, consumers, we have these laws going into effect in California because they're very popular with consumers. People really want their privacy protected, people want net neutrality, and if we are going to operate at a federal level, I think you know my experience in Congress leads me to believe that the only way for that to get done is for the federal legislation to be really meaningful and have real teeth. Uh, I don't think it's reasonable to expect federal preemption of state laws without something meaningful replacing them. And actually, could I jump in on your question about comparing the U.S. and Europe? Yeah, sorry, I went a little off, yeah. the, <laughs> off the mark Oops. there. My uh, mic phone keeps coming off. So uh, I think one way I would like to shift uh, the focus a little bit is to say, why do, does the U.S. have this uh, enormous presence in the tech space? Why have we been such an innovative part of, right. of the economy? And we might say, well, because it has, we do have a different approach here in right. the U.S., right? We're looking much more at the consumer welfare standard. Is this good for consumers? Is it, you know, giving them a lower prices, more, more choices, th things like that, including on privacy uh, as well? Like, if, if you have a regime that's highly regulatory, is that keeping people from uh, innovating and inventing? So I think we, we need to think, to think about that. Now, Europe does have different laws for n a number of different reasons. They look at privacy uh, through a different lens. They look at it as a human, a human right. Uh, and then on the antitrust side, they were um, uh, a lot of economies that had big state-owned enterprises, right? So as they've uh, looked at their antitrust laws, they are looking at companies who may have gained their big market share because the government um, owned them, not because they competed to that, to that point. So I think we need to, to look We've at that. We've got a new mic for you there. That was valiant. I feel like giving you a round of applause <laughs> for <laughs> answering and holding that there. It's a, <laughs> Thank you for, for, for putting up with this. Um, I, I, I do think these issues, you know, I know Dean Garfield will be in the program later. We did an Atlantic event recently on, on privacy and technology, and we had a, a number of the tech um, industry associations there, and all of them are so high on the FTC. They said, you know, the way forward is Europe may think it's setting the standard and it's out there right now. California's come up with something that doesn't, they see is, that doesn't quite work. But they, you know, Dean Garfield was very bold, and he said publicly, I believe the U.S. can get a privacy standard, can get a bill, can get legislation done. That, that becomes a standard that essentially helps you know, set a norm around the world, and the FTC needs to be the, um, uh, the guarantor of that, essentially. And I guess when I hear all of industry praise an agency, I worry. So what, now that you're out of it, what should we be worried about in terms of the industry applauding you? Well, I, one of the reasons why I think the industry is looking to the FTC is, is because of our flexible statute that has been not based on laying out like strict rules that are predicting where technology is going to be going because I don't think government is particularly good at that. Right. Uh, but focusing more on what is the harm? Has there been harm to consumers? Let's redress that. Let's let's stop that. Yeah. Uh, the FTC is also a bipartisan agency, right? Mm. And so we do work generally through a consensus model. I think that's very important uh, because I think then it reflects an approach that where there's more uh, common ground and there's more buy-in. So I think the FTC model, you know, focused on harm, focused on case-by-case -case, uh, enforcement, and with a, a, you know, somewhat of a bipartisan consensus as much as we can get it, which is really quite a lot, uh, has been a, an effective model thus far. Before we leave, I want to come to you because I know you can't answer this question, but you can answer everything now. <laughs> Should we be worried about Jeff Bezos and Amazon? I mean, no company is above the law, 
right? So what we should be concerned about is, is there a company that is, one, promising things to consumers and not delivering on their promises or using uh, their information, consumers' information in a way that causes substantial injury to consumers? Or two, is there a company that is no longer competing on uh, the merits? It's gotten a big market share, and now it's using that to shut down competition. Uh, and, that, and so any company can fall into that bucket. Um, but and do you think Amazon is falling into that bucket? Um, I mean, thus far, I haven't seen that that, you know, we did bring a case against Amazon for in-app purchases where we felt they hadn't been clear enough about when consumers were going to be charged. We actually had to litigate that case quite aggressively out in the, um, in the Ninth Circuit, uh, and, uh, and we, we won. Uh, so, I mean, I think, you know, we, we need to pay attention to any company. Now, on the competition front, uh, the FTC did allow uh, Amazon to buy Whole Foods hmm. uh, last, last year. Uh, and one of the things that really struck me was uh, a local magazine, The Washingtonian, <clears throat> had an issue this March that talked about the golden age of grocery shopping, right? So what are we concerned about? We're concerned about consumers. Uh, are this, is this behavior hurting consumers? Is this uh, uh, merger hurting, hurting consumers? And that's what we always need to be alert for. Steve, can I go, yes, uh -huh, can I go back to your, your previous question sure. about um, the FTC as where industry is looking and should we be suspicious right. of that? I want to make the point that I made earlier about our current authorities there. If I, I would be concerned if we were expected to solve privacy globally within the, uh, or even in the U.S., within the confines of the authority that we have now. Uh, I think if the question is, is Congress taking a serious look at the idea of a national privacy law, a preemptive national privacy law, which I think members on both sides have talked about. Um, they say they are. Yeah, yeah. I, and, and I think that that's sincere. Um, to me, the FTC has the expertise to do it. I think we have the experience, the personnel, and I think because we have both competition and consumer protection expertise, we are the right place to house that. So I like that, however, I don't think we can do it effectively unless we have more authority of the kind that I talked about in terms of rulemaking. You know, I, I disagree a little bit with Maureen that case by case is exactly the right way to handle this issue because I think there's a lot to be said for giving companies clear, transparent rules of the road in how to protect data, which then also give us a hook for bigger fines and, and a monetary penalty on the back end. So I think more authority and resources can't be discounted. We are a tiny little agency. Maureen likes to say, and I think she's right, that we punch way above our weight. Um, you know, we have about, the FTC had 50% more employees at the beginning of the Reagan administration than it does today. We have a budget of about $300 million. Just last week, we returned $500 million in one day to consumers, um, paying them back for, uh, how they'd been scammed as part of a payday lending issue. That's very effective return on investment for the American taxpayer, but we have a lot that we cover in our mission and our ability to do all of that with our current budget and our current staffing resources mm. is really hamstrung. So, you know, I think if we had more, we could do a lot more, but, but it's really important that we be properly resourced and have, have effective authority. And I hope that that's something that goes into the debate in Congress as it moves forward. Thank you for that. Uh, let me ask you just sort of a larger um, question. A few years ago, I think most Americans, you know, at that time felt that the large companies, the social media platforms and others, and the large uh, uh, data holders on them, you know, they, they were in a way uh, applauding those firms in their battle with things like the National Security Agency and the FBI. Who, who were trying to make a national security case for access uh, to private information. And I think that applause has, has collapsed because now it looks to many as if these data companies may not be giving data to the FBI and NSA, but are giving it to a lot of other uh, uh, folks that, that, that citizens may see as nefarious or not in their interests and whatnot and using them ways. So you know, it's interesting that that social compact has come, up, come apart. And I'm just interested if you could step away from the rulemaking and kind of talk about what the features of a healthy social contract between citizens and industry might look like. 
Wow, that was a lot. There's a lot to unpack in that yeah. particular question. Um, but I think I mean, it's an important question. I think it is a really important question. Uh, you're raising issues of consumer trust, right. of privacy, of government access versus private company access to data. A lot of that goes into questions of transparency, right? What is happening to my data? Do I know who has access to it? Do I know what could happen to it if somebody else gets access to it? Is it properly secure? Um, exactly. I think. Just answer all of those questions. I will answer. Yeah. I will solve them yeah. right now, yeah. <laughs> right here. Uh, listen, I think businesses across America and across the globe know that their brand matters, consumer trust matters. That's a business question for them as well as a policy question. Um, and I think we have to think about how all those things play together uh, from the perspective of, a regular, of an enforcement agency whose job is to protect consumers and promote competition. I want consumers to feel like they have meaningful choice. I want them to feel like they have some control and some options. And I think how the government works with the private sector, um, both sides have pieces to play in, in establishing that trust Maureen. or protecting that trust. So I always uh, like to go back to history and say, have we had these discussions before? Right. Uh, and we have, right? So I went back, I actually wrote a law review article on this. You went back to the origins of the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the credit reporting agencies, where you had consumers saying, there's this organization, it's got computers, it's got information about me, and I don't know how, how it's being used. And so, uh, and that was for credit reporting, and, and so Congress passed the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Uh, I, I agree with Becca that consumers should, you know, if a promise has been made to them about how their data will be used or collected or shared, the company has to keep that promise. And we've brought a lot of enforcement actions uh, in uh, to, to, to do that. So, for example, you know, while I was the chair, we brought enforcement actions uh, against uh, VTech, the first connected toys case. We brought one against uh, Uber for not uh, keeping its promises about how it was going to uh, give access or, or actually you know, not give access to uh, information about consumers. The list, the list really go, goes on and on. Lenovo, that was another case. Um, and then the other thing that I think is the substantial harm part, right? So is data being used in a way that causes substantial harm to consumers that su consumers can't reasonably avoid on their own and that isn't outweighed by benefits to competition or consumer protection, which is actually the FTC's statute, mm. right? That is our unfairness authority. So I do think it's very important that we continue to be active on this front and say, has there been a promise to a consumer it hasn't been met? Or has their data been used in a way that harms them? Because ultimately, you know, you're talking about consumers' trust and uh, ability to rely on these um, companies, uh, I think that's very important. And it's one of the reasons why when I was the acting chair, I did take the very unusual steps of making public the fact that we were doing an investigation of the Equifax data breach uh, and of the Facebook uh, Cambridge Analytica issue, because I felt that we had such white hot intensity there. And if the public and other parts of the government and our international partners thought, oh, well, the, FD, the U.S. just isn't taking a look at this, I thought that that could be very damaging. Before I go to the audience, let me just ask you both, both really quickly a silly question. Um, uh, I've always been intrigued that the Department of Justice Antitrust Division sort of swims in some of the same places you do. Um, from your perspective and your bias, what makes you cooler? <laughs> well, I mean, we share antitrust oversight with the Department of Justice which is important, which is one of the reasons why I always say we should keep the, uh, what the FTC is doing uh, very much in line with traditional antitrust enforcement because if you have, uh, and we, we share jurisdiction and what we do is we kind of divide up cases based on industry, uh, right. you know, um, uh, what industry expertise that we have. So we want to be sure that something isn't a violation if it goes to the FTC, gets cleared, uh, but it's, a viol it's not a violation if it goes to the DOJ. I mean, one of the great things about the FTC, and it's really in our DNA, is we are primarily, 
primarily a law enforcement agency. We have a very big policy function. Mm. Uh, these hearings that are coming up are an important uh, aspect of that. But we've, I used to be head of the Office of Policy Planning at the FTC, and we've done in-depth research and reports. We have an entire Bureau of Economics with over 70 PhD economists who help us bring that policy overlay to our enforcement work. So the right. DOJ, you know, it's a great agency, it does wonderful enforcement. But, but, uh, but the FTC, yeah. I think we were created a little bit differently, uh, and it is, it uh. is uh, I think, really been a good, um, a good thing uh, for consumers. Back to any quick addendum? Yeah, I would add the fact that we're an independent agency. You know, we're mm. technically executive branch, but we are not really under the umbrella of the executive branch. We operate independently. I think that's very important. Um, I also think the fact that we do not only competition but also consumer protection has always been important and, as I said earlier, is increasingly important today as questions about data and technology uh, infiltrate all of our mission on both sides of the right. agency. Well, thank you. Very cool. Let me open up the uh, floor to questions and comments. Yes, right up here in the front, Andrew Schwartz. See, I remember. He was the first guy in the room. <laughs> first seat. Yes, we're going to bring a microphone to you. Uh, my name is Andrew Schwartz, as Crappy pointed out, very impressive. Um, so Q2 was the GDPR deadline, it was I think May 28th, right. and there were two things that I found that were interesting about that conversion. One is the fact that the policy had no bounds. Companies, large and small, multi-billion, multi-million dollar, they all converted, even in the U.S. Companies right. chose not to have separate code bases. I don't think a lot of people noticed because a lot of companies seemed mm. to make that conversion pretty seamlessly. Right. So we have this regional law, international presence, pretty swift conversion. Can the U.S. learn from that success that companies were able to do that kind of conversion without a lot of issue, assuming you right. also agree that it's a success in our own policy? Plan? Great, great question. So and can we do something not clunky? Uh, so listen, I think we have a lot to learn from GDPR. I would say if you talk to companies that spend time getting ready to comply, they didn't just turn a switch overnight. They had a long runway and they put a lot of effort into figuring out how they were gonna comply. Um, I think, I don't know, personally, I have, I have experienced a lot more click-through consent on uh, post-GDPR and I query whether that has the kind of meaningful transparency that it was intended to have if you're just always clicking accept, accept, accept to move through. But, it's a, but it is a great example of how we can learn from what they're doing to figure out if the U.S. is going to do something, what would we want to do the same? What would we want to do differently? Are there problems that were unanticipated in the development of this law? Which again, took a lot of time and effort to put together. And I think it, we experienced the implementation as overnight, right. but it, that's not how it happened. You want to comment, Marine? Um, I also would say I think it's a little too soon to say it's been successful because what we don't know yet is the unintended consequences right. that resulted. Has this created a regime where only the big companies can really afford to uh, comply well? Uh, and how is this going to be enforced? I think we really need to answer those questions before we say this is a model that we should um, emulate. Yes, right here. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Isaac Warren, datacrats.org. I would like to ask about the conduct of the hearings so far that you mentioned in your opening statements. Uh, specifically, uh, I tried to submit comments. I noticed there's about 243 comments on regulation.gov, and it strikes me as not being popular enough. Uh, you've you basically published an uh, agenda. Of right. So let, let them answer. That's great. So can you talk about how you see or the, as you see the context of the um, tech privacy hearings that you've had so far? Uh, yeah, listen, to the extent that your question is we need more input, how are you going to get more input? I agree. I would like to see as many people who as have views about this participate in the process. It's always a challenge to try to tell people that something is happening and get them to participate, but I'd love to see... And everybody, please go file comments yeah, here. Yeah, please do. We'll, I mean, it, it really does. The, the uh, output of the hearings is going to be as credible as the breadth of its input, and so I think that that is really important, and I I'd really encourage people to participate. And quick thought? Uh, I don't have anything. Yeah, great. Talk. Yes, sir, right here. Yeah, hi, Tony Cherry, and this is meant to be a neutral question. I'm just curious, though, how many computer scientists or data scientists are employed by the FTC 
as you're looking to establish policy over highly technical areas? So that's always a, a really good question that we get, and it's uh, we have a few. Uh, we at different times have had a chief technologist, but one of the things that we do is we use experts, right? So, for example, if we have a case where we're we're looking at, you know, did this company have you know uh, proper data security uh, in in place? We'll hire experts to do that rather than have them in house. It's a lot like what we do. Uh, we do a lot of competition in the healthcare space. Uh, we don't have doctors mm -hmm. on staff, right? We have right. experts that we that we call upon to provide that. I think we could use a little more technical expertise within the FTC. We have some in the Bureau of Consumer Protection, uh, but I don't think that it's uh, you know something that using experts, uh, you know, uh, I, I think that works pretty well. Yeah, we, listen, I think we need more, right? We have it. We have, as Maureen mentioned, seventy economists in house. We have an economist analyze every case we bring consumer protection and competition, I think we could benefit from a similar model for technologists as more and more of our cases have a technology implication. Let me just, in wrapping up, ask you one final question. You know, I use Amazon, Facebook, I love Facebook, I'm uh, okay to say that, uh, Twitter, uh, Apple is in my pocket, and so all of the companies we're talking about have become very much a part of my life. In Europe recently, when I interviewed the commissioner for a single digital economy and very involved with the GDPR, I asked him, would you ever give birth to a Twitter or to a Facebook in, these, in a GDPR world? And he very honestly said, no, not likely. We need the United States to do that. You invent, we regulate. And I found it a very provocative statement. Is this on well, it was on stage in public, yeah. And no, uh, was it Andres Onslip? Yes, it, yes, it was Andres, who's Estonian. Yes. Uh, and uh, Andres Onslip. And, and, um, and I guess my just final question to you is, do we run the risk of going too far as we think about regulation, that we end up undermining the ecosystem that gave birth to some of these companies? I think we do, right? Mm -hmm. And that kind of goes back to my observation about, you know, oh, the, the, te the U.S. tech companies, you know, are, are getting, uh, you know, the subject of in, in, uh, enforcement in Europe, it's because those things were invented here. They're invented mm. in the U.S., and there's a reason they were invented here. There's also a reason a lot of these things were invented in, in California, too. Mm. So um, I think it's important to look at what the regulatory structure is for its impact on innovation, and we can't presume that um, having much more unpredictable, stringent, um, or unpredictable or stringent, because you can have one or the other, Becca, um, could, could uh, kill the golden goose. Yeah, you, I, but I, I think it's a fair point, but I also think we can't presume the other way. I mean, Maureen pointed out that a lot of these companies were born in California, which is one of the most highly regulated states and most regulatory aggress regulatorily aggressive states in the country. So yeah, we can't presume that new regulation would protect innovation, but we also can't presume that it would stifle it. It's why it's important to do it well and carefully and intelligently, and I, I hope that the FTC can continue to be a part of that debate as, as it moves forward. Thank you. I feared ending an agreement, and luckily we didn't. <laughs> uh, thank you both. Maureen Olhausen, thank you so much. Rebecca Kelly-Slaughter, thank you both, both of the Federal Trade Commission. Thank you for your time. Thank you.